creativity is a daily, repetitious act. It's not something that you just sort of sit down and say, okay, creativity, join me, let's go. It's something that you have to work at and you really have to cultivate that skill. Hi, I'm Maximilian Busser, founder of MBNF. To me, watchmaking is art with a capital A. Watchmaking is about creating kinetic sculptures. Watchmaking is more important be a mindset. It's a journey. The history of watchmaking is filled with adventurers, dreamers, engineers, artists, who will each in their own way contribute to a better world. The watchmaking journey is first and foremost about very special individuals. Some are rebels and mavericks, and most have a little touch of madness. Now, over the years, we've come to realize that many MBNF owners are adventurers themselves. A collector's circle called the tribe is filled with them. Many have amazing lives and stories to tell, and this is why I decided to start this podcast. Today, I'm glad to welcome one of them, someone I would define as a dreamer, someone so passionate about artisanal watchmaking that he left everything behind to follow his dreams. Welcome to this new episode of Tales from the Tribe. Todd, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. I'm deeply honored to welcome you for the second episode of this podcast. Thank you, Max. It's great to be here. I'm I'm really touched to be included in the podcast and actually to be the second episode. Very happy to be here today with you. We have a lot to talk about, so I'm going to go right in. I called you a dreamer. Did I introduce you well? I think so. I think anyone who's known me would say that uh, dreaming has been a large part of my life and a large part of my life's work. I think I'd add writer, creator, advisor, and all-around tinkerer in the watch industry uh, to that description. Uh, What's the most amazing thing you've ever done to pursue that dream? I think the first most amazing thing I've ever done is when I was writing 32 Regrets, I knew that I couldn't go back to the world of regretters. I had to turn my life around to become a dreamer. And so I think the first most positive thing I did to attain that dream was write the book, sit down, do the interviews and do the work. And then I honestly had a hard time answering this question because I think one of the things that came out of this was I just had to start. And the book was that starting place. And from that starting place, I started pursuing the world of independent watchmaking, writing about watchmaking, uh, photographing more watches, making films about independent watchmaking. And I think the creatively most fulfilling thing that I've done has been Seeking Perfect. You and I have spoken a lot about creativity, and you told me that it's the greatest drug known to man. And when you when you get it, you just want more. In doing that project, I learned exactly what you meant. So that was a project you did in parallel to your, I'll say in brackets, normal life? Uh, that was a project actually that started during my, quote, normal life, and actually came out of sort of two years of work, two years of tinkering, and two years of really thinking about how this project would come to life. And was there any tipping point which made you suddenly decide, okay, this is what I'm going to do the rest of my life? Yes. So I'm sure everyone can relate to this. I'm sure everyone has sort of pulled into the parking lot at work or gotten off the train going to their office and had that moment of, I'm not in the office yet. I could just turn around and go home and call in sick. And I I had had those moments so many times in my life. But when I started working on 32 Regrets, when I was actually able to get some of the interviews that I did for the book, um, you, of course, being one of those individuals, when I was able to land some of those interviews, I started to think, okay, I've I've got something here. This, This could be it. And at the same time, I was thinking about sort of the watch industry at large and the storytelling in the watch industry. And the tipping point really came after publishing 32 Regrets when sort of it felt like the floodgates opened and a whole new world opened to me in terms of creating for the watch industry. So... As you mentioned, you've created, you wrote that incredible book called 32 Regrets, A Guide to Reclaiming Creativity. And um, you mentioned examples of entrepreneurs of 
successfully turn their life passions into self-sustaining ventures. Why did you call it 32 Regrets? And why did you specifically use the word regret? This is a great question. So over the years, I've sort of kept a journal and I've called it many different things. And I actually have a Google Doc that I'm sure I could dig up somewhere that has a list of company ideas that I've had over my entire lifetime. And when I started to look at that list, it was everything from sort of a jujitsu gi company making, you know, bespoke martial arts uniforms that had cool designs and cool artwork to a hand-built bicycle company to a company that used drones for avalanche mitigation. And so I had this whole wide disparate range of ideas, but I never actually really put my heart into achieving any of them. And when I sat down and counted that list, there were 32 companies on that list. And as I started to think about it, I realized that they weren't ideas for companies. They were my regrets. They were things that I had a voice in, that I had a choice to pursue those, and I didn't. And regret is one of the most powerful emotions that humans can experience. In a study of British adults, regret was the second highest named emotion. You know, not love, not happiness, not joy. It was regret. And so regret is always first and sort of forefront to our minds. And regret is a really powerful force because regret only arises when you had agency in the decision. So if you had agency in the decision and you see the outcome that could have been, you experience regret. But if you didn't have agency in the decision, you experience uh, disappointment. So it's different emotions um, when you see what the outcome could have been. But regret is just this really powerful human emotion that I think everyone has felt in their lifetime. And I felt this powerful regret over not having started because I had so many opportunities to do so. And I realized that I couldn't experience a 33rd regret. I had to go forward and pursue dreams. Wow. I must admit, uh, regrets or striving not to have any is what made me create MBNF, and you know that. Uh, my biggest regret is I never told my dad that I loved him, because unfortunately he never told me that he loved me. And um, and so when he passed away, then therapy and many other things happened, and I decided I don't want to have any regrets at the end of my life. And that was the tipping point for me to create the company. Can you sort of single out your biggest regret to date, if I'm not being too... Uh, curious? <laughs> well, there's there's at least 32 of them, and there, there's a lot more beyond that. But I, I think the biggest regret that I have is not starting earlier, is just not picking an idea and getting started. You and I have spoken about the idea of failure. And failure is this big, scary thing that we're taught to fear from a very young age, because you don't want to fail the test in school. If you fail the test, you're not good enough. But I think failure is a really powerful tool for learning. And I, I just, I really regret not starting one of those companies and giving it a try because I probably would have failed, but failure is better than regret because if you fail, you learn something and you can take those lessons and apply them to the next company or the next idea. So I think my biggest regret is not starting with that first idea. Makes sense. Now, do you think going forward, you're going to do one of those companies? You're going to create them or not? Well, I've already created one of them. And that is what I'm doing now in terms of creating filmmaking, photography, and writing about independent watchmaking. And I absolutely love the work I'm doing, but I definitely see that there is more that I want to do. And it's a little bit addictive when you start working on a problem and you start creating solutions and you're doing stuff and, and people are responding to it. You definitely want to pursue those more. And I keep coming back to this idea that I had when I was in grad school, actually. I, and, and I mentioned it earlier. I wanted to use drones for avalanche mitigation. You know, a lot of times we're using World War II or Korea era howitzer artillery pieces and explosives that, you know, ski patrollers throw by hand. 
it's an incredible risk to have humans playing with explosives or using explosives to set off avalanches to make ski areas safe. And I love the idea of using drones. And I think when I started working on this, the unmanned aerial systems space was too much of a nascent technology. I didn't see how it could go forward. But now with all of those options drying up, there aren't those artillery rounds to use. There's much tighter controls on who has access to these explosives that professional ski patrols use to set off avalanches. Don't get me wrong. The government was not crazy about the idea of flying armed (laughs) drones around to set off avalanches. Let's just, (laughs) let's get that out of the way. They weren't crazy about it. But I do think from a human risk standpoint, you could have some standoff capability. You'd be able to control avalanches without putting human lives in danger. And you'd actually be able to record, get video, and be able to analyze that to learn and do better. So that's a company that I keep coming back to. I may change my answer to what I regret most. That might be the one I regret the most, because I think it was a cool use of technology that really could protect not only the lives of first responders, but also the lives of people skiing at ski resorts. And that's one that I regret deeply because I knew what needed to be done, but I just don't think I understood enough how early the technology was and how much it would change in a very short time. For sure. Being too early as an entrepreneur is always an enormous risk of failure. If I come back to your your book, um, you make a difference between dreamers and regretters which has nothing to do with winners versus losers. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think it's interesting that you pull out the dreamers versus regretters instead of winners versus losers. You brought the Nelson Mandela quote, you never win or lose, you learn, into my thinking. I think with dreaming and regretting, it's not a winning or a losing proposition. It's just a difference in the way that you think. And I don't think that dreamers are always winners and regretters are always losers. I think the paradigm of dreamers and regretters came out of what I looked at when I looked at sort of employment data. You know, 49% of people in 2017 study reported being somewhat satisfied in their job. And that left me thinking, like, there's there are 51% of people who are less than somewhat satisfied in their work. And that just resonated with me so deeply because it felt so unfulfilling and and so unfulfilled. And as I dove deeper into this, I realized that there were sort of two camps in this world. There were people who dreamed, who practiced more divergent thinking, who thought more blue sky, big picture, what if type of questions, and regretters, people who really lived in this world of convergent thinking, which is that sort of judging, looking at ideas, and dismissing ideas. As I started to interview people and interview these entrepreneurs for the book, I realized that all of them lived in this world of divergent thinking, where they're always thinking, what if? How do we push the envelope? What could be? I realized that I was stuck in this world of thinking, looking at my list of 32 ideas, judging them, saying, no, that'll never work, and dismissing them out of hand. And I think in the world of dreamers and regretters, if we could get more people to think about the what-if possibilities. And if we could get more people thinking about what is possible, we're our greatest limiters in terms of what we are capable of. We're capable of so much more if we could just get out of our own way. And so these two camps really clearly started to emerge for me. And it's not right or wrong to be in one camp or the other, but I'd looked at studies from NASA from 1968. You know, NASA was looking for the smartest people that they could put on the Apollo missions because this was cutting edge technology at the time. And, you know, like your iPhone has more technology in it than the Apollo space capsules did. But Dr. George Land and Dr. Beth Jarman were tasked with finding the most creative people within NASA. And so they built this test and then they said, well, why don't we test this on kids? Let's see how creative kids are. And of the, you know, I think it was 1,200 four and five-year-olds who were surveyed, all of them scored in the 98th percentile for highly creative. They were the most highly creative. 
And then as time went on and the study followed these kids, that creativity level got less and less and less. And of the over a million adults who were surveyed using this test, only 2% of them scored in the highly creative category. And they surmised that something about school and our education system sort of teaches the creativity out of you. And so I wrote 32 Regrets really to help people move from that world of regret into the world of dreaming, even if it's not creating a company or creating a unicorn technology company like many of the success stories we see today, but just to get people creating again. If they were taking photographs on their phone or drawing or experiencing that feeling of your inner five-year-old being sort of a light, that's really what I wanted people to experience. And so I think everyone can move from the world of regret into the world of dreamers, but there's no right or wrong way to do that. And there's no winning or losing if you're in either camp. I just think in the world of dreamers, you open so many more possibilities for yourself and I'd love to see more people get there. It's funny because you and I, we've had these discussions of like, all kids are creative. Every five-year-old is creative. And then, uh, as you said, when they hit 20 or something like that, they don't even consider themselves creative anymore, even though they are. It's, they've got it in them. And that's a daily battle for me with my two daughters, is how to keep them creative and, how do I say proud of creating. With everything you've learned, with all the interviews you've done, do you have any tips to, to stimulate creativity as much in kids as in adults? Yeah, this was one of the, like, the really fun pieces of researching for this book, because I asked all of these entrepreneurs and creators who I spoke to what they do to sort of spark their creativity. And I started to realize that creativity is a daily, repetitious act. It's not something that you just sort of sit down and say, okay, creativity, join me, let's go. It's something that you have to work at and you really have to cultivate that skill. And I think the baseline is, like you said, if you look at any four or five-year-old or even a two-year-old, they are insanely creative. So it's innate within all of us to be a creator. It's hardwired into our DNA. It's there. So whenever anyone says, I'm not creative, I don't believe it. I think everybody is creative. Everyone has a creator and an artist within them, and you have to honor that. And so as I started speaking to these entrepreneurs and creators, what really stood out to me is everyone has a different path to reaching their creativity. And for some, that's stillness and quiet, whether that's meditation or breath work or just sitting with your thoughts. For some people, it was journaling and maybe sitting quietly and journaling ideas and writing. One guy I interviewed, Dan Killian, who created a board game, actually, or a card game, I should say, he would sit and he'd open a blank Google Doc and he would just sit in his apartment for two or three hours and write everything that came to his mind. And he found that the deeper he got into that session, the better the ideas became. And so he was, you know, just every day working at ideas and then combining those ideas in new ways. And that's how he'd find his creativity. For some people, it's walking or getting outside, getting time in nature or being active. There were a couple of studies that showed that you're about 88% more creative when you're moving than when you're just sitting. So for people who are just trying to get started, I'd say go for a walk. You know, don't put any headphones in, don't look at your phone, but go for a walk. Hear what's going on inside of your head, hear what you're being called to do, and what's catching your eye when you're out walking. Are you noticing certain things? You know, are you noticing cars or bikes? Or are you noticing trees, the way the sunlight is hitting sort of your landscape or your cityscape? Look at those things, because I think those things provide a direction for where you can go with your creativity. But it's that sort of daily act of allowing creativity to come into your life that is one of the foremost things that most of these folks do. And do you have a routine? I do. You know, we had talked about this before, you know, like, is it a specific morning routine or is there something that you do? I don't think it comes down to one singular formulaic 
routine that will work for everyone. I've often found that prescriptive things don't work for me because I start to do the prescriptive thing and then I say like, "Ah, I don't want to do this anymore. This is too confining. This requires a focus that I don't necessarily have. But for me, the, the biggest thing that I can do for my creativity is actually working out first thing in the morning because then I'm like totally energized throughout the day. And I have this sort of creative buzz about me because as I work out, I start to let ideas run around in my head. As they run around, I start to make sense of them and kind of rank order things. And then I get to my desk and I'm kind of buzzing with energy. I feel very alive. And it's really easy for me to slip into a flow state at that point and just be really creative. But one of the things about that is you can only be creative for a certain number of hours. It's not something you can do for sort of 12 hours at a time. If you really enter a flow state and you're really working well, it's possible. But the first distraction that comes up usually shatters that bubble that you're in. So as much as you can, protect that creative time, because I think that getting those moments of pure creativity and pure flow state don't happen very often. So when you do enter one, I feel like you have to really protect it. It's beautifully said. I'm going to just shift gears just because we met through your interviews on your book, but we also met through your love of watchmaking. And I'd like to dive in a little bit into that. So is that something you had early on? Is that something you developed? Take us through that journey, please. Absolutely. My love of watches really began when I was six years old. I was with my family and my father worked in finance and he wore what I would call like this boring business guy attire. And it was usually loafers, khaki pants, an Oxford button down shirt, and usually a gold watch of some kind. And I looked around at his peer group and I was like, cookie cutter, it's the same, it's the same, it's the same. And one day I remember seeing one of his sort of peers And he was wearing a dive watch on a yellow rubber strap with a yellow dial. And I immediately went, that's different. That's really cool. And I started to think to myself sort of, why is that so cool? And I I think I realized in that moment that watches are the ultimate tool for self-expression. They are the, the best way to express yourself to the outside world. And in a world of sort of boring business uniforms, Wearing that yellow dive watch made that gentleman stand out even more to me. And so that's really where it begins. And from there, I dragged my parents into every store we passed that had watches. It could have been a hardware store that was selling, you know, like Timex or Victor Knox watches like in a display case. It did not matter to me. I also, I'm sure I went in and looked at Rolexes and Patek Philippe's and Omega's. I had no idea what I was looking at at the time. I just knew that watches were really cool and that I wanted to explore and learn that world better. And that passion has always stuck with me. It fell out of favor a little bit when I was in in high school and college. It just wasn't something I was tracking. And then when I entered the workforce, I had a boss who loved watches. And so he and I would talk watches all the time. And this was At the time when Hodinkee was starting, when Gear Patrol and Uncrate were starting, and I realized there was an entire world of watchmaking that I didn't know anything about, and that was this world of independent watchmaking. Because one of the watches that popped up, and I think it was on Uncrate, was the nitroglycerin watch, which was the collaboration between MBNF and Urwerk. And that watch just completely melted my brain because it was so different to anything else I had seen. And it was just such a unique watch. I didn't understand at all what was going on in that watch at the time, but I knew that it was something that I wanted to learn more about. I think really from that second on, I was hooked into independent watchmaking. These websites were sort of in their early development phases. There wasn't a lot of watch media out there. There were a lot of forums But there wasn't a lot of coverage. There's not as much coverage as there is today of independent watchmaking. But from that moment forward, I was just absolutely hooked. I was in every watch shop I could find. I was reading every book I could find, forums, websites, everything I could do to learn more about watchmaking. I was doing it. I 
actually more recently you you did an incredible documentary on De Béthune and following uh, Denis Flageolet in particular. Now, from your dream of what you loved about watches and actually diving into that story, did it connect? Were you even more impressed? Were the things which disappointed you connecting to the reality from the dream? The idea for Seeking Perfect began about two years, two and a half years maybe, before we even made the film. I had been looking at a lot of watch media, reading a lot of watch media, and I had also been watching a lot of Top Gear, the uh, the BBC motoring show with Jeremy Clarkson, James May, and Richard Hammond. And I had been watching that show, and I had this feeling that something like that in the watch industry could work. Like, there could be a really cool show where it was segments with reviews, news, and then traveling to ateliers to actually learn about the makers and the watches and see new releases. And so that was the original concept for the show. And so for about six months, I was working on that. And then six months in, I I sort of had this epiphany of like, well, who are going to be the three presenters of this show? I don't even know where to find two other people who are half as in love with this world as I am. I don't know where to begin there. And so it sort of changed from this three-person talk show, if you will, into a documentary series. And I started and I identified 12 brands that I wanted to make documentaries on. And so I started to do deep research on each of those brands, highlight important pieces, the history of the brand, how many people they employ, how many pieces they produce annually. And so out of that started to come this concept around seeking perfect. After I finished 32 Regrets, I really started to hone in on Denny Flagelet and Dibetun. Denny just does things differently. He's such a creative person. He's incredibly humble. He's incredibly creative. And he is one of few people that I've met who could probably teach himself how to do absolutely anything on this planet. He bought an axe from a hardware store for felling trees and decided that the handle was all wrong and that he hated it. And he went into his wood shop and then made his own handle for his axe that fit his needs better. I just don't know many people that do that type of thing. And to watch Denny work in the forge, to see what he's created with Debatoon, to really see the history and the small changes and the evolution that has occurred, it just started to make sense. And I I connected with Wei through a friend, and we had been talking for some time about a show and the stories we wanted to tell. And we kind of highlighted three brands. And because of his relationship with Denny, we sort of had this moment of, yeah, that's the starting point. That's where we need to begin this journey. And so from inception or idea, it was about two and a half years worth of work, worth of sitting at my computer, writing, editing, scripting, doubting starting again to actually meeting with our team and saying, okay, let's go make this film. Let's go do this. And it's surreal to look back on those two years and think about how much work went into it and how much love went into it. And today it is still the most creatively fulfilling project that I've ever worked on. And did that enhance your love of watchmaking? Yes. It <laughs> it actually... it increase my love of watchmaking probably tenfold. Because when you get to see the creators and the makers behind the brands, and you get to know the people, it's not just about the objects that they create, it's really about the people themselves. And when you get to spend time with someone like Denny, who not only is forging a case for a watch that is gorgeous and that he's making from ore that he found near his atelier, but he also then cooks you a fondue at night, you get to spend time with these incredibly creative and incredibly wonderful human beings. And that's really what I would love to help people learn about the watch industry, is that yes, the watches and the product are amazing, but the people behind the brands and the people who make these watches, and not just the name who's at the head of the brand, everybody from Denny Flagelet all the way down at Debatoon was welcoming and loving and beautiful. 
And I think that's what I wish people knew about the watch industry. And so if Seeking Perfect can help highlight that, it's already a huge win. I so agree with you. And it's it's an extraordinary documentary. And as you said, the Denis and his story and are absolutely the, one of the greatest examples of why artisanal watchmaking is what we all love. Actually, I realize I didn't ask you a question. That little kid who was six years old who saw that yellow dial watch, what did you want to do when you were six years old? I think there's three phases here that I'll answer. The first one, when I was six years old, I really wanted to be an emergency room doctor. I wanted to be a trauma doctor or a trauma surgeon, somebody who helped people in the worst moments of their life. Was that because of ER the show on <laughs> George Clooney? That was actually a huge influence probably because ER was starting at that time. And I think that was a huge influence. And we just had a number of family friends who were doctors. And I was just sort of in awe of the fact that people would help other humans at the worst moments in their lives. Wow. And maybe just to finish, what would the child you were think of the adult you've become? I think the child that I was would now be really proud of who I've become because I've honored that creator, that artisan within me. And that's really what I wanted to be. And just to go back to your last question, you know, when I entered high school, I really wanted to be either a photojournalist or a, an actor, of some sort. Chris Farley was a huge influence on me. I took classes at Second City here in Chicago. I loved stand-up comedy and improv. It was just one of those things that I wanted to do. And I actually feel like I'm getting to live both of those dreams out now as uh, a little bit of a performer making films with a little bit of my photography work and getting to write about something that I love. I find it incredibly creatively fulfilling and I know that six-year-old and that 16-year-old are proud. I'm sure they are. It's been a real privilege meeting you, Todd, and I'm so happy you've, uh, you've taken the time to answer these questions. And I'm sure the listeners will find a lot of cues to start thinking about their own lives. So thank you very much, Todd. Thank you for having me, Max. I really appreciate it. It's been an honor to be part of the Tribe podcast. And I'd love to leave you with a quote that has had a huge impact on my life, and I, I hope it will for everyone who listens to this too. And it's something that F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote, actually. I think this will resonate with you, Max, because I think it's something that probably you can relate to. And that is, for what it's worth, it's never too late, or in my case, too early, to be whoever you want to be. There's no time limit. Stop whenever you want. You can change or you can stay the same. There are no rules to this thing. We can make the best or the worst of it. I hope you make the best of it. And I hope you see things that startle you. I hope you feel things you've never felt before. I hope you meet people with a different point of view. I hope you live a life you're proud of. And if you find you're not, I hope you have the courage to start all over. Wow. Todd, you're a star. Thank you very much. Thank you, Max. It's been a pleasure. And that brings us to the end of today's episode. Thank you for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed our conversation with Todd and that you had a glimpse at his fascinating journey. We'll soon be back for a conversation with another of our tribe members. If you enjoyed today's episode, remember to subscribe to our podcast so as not to miss our next conversations. Stay curious, keep exploring, and cherish your madness.